Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 649. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is March 2nd, 2021. All right, welcome to another show. Tuesday is our normal taping show. Friday can come and go as the news, but we try to sit down every Tuesday and hammer out what happened over the weekend. And well, guess what? A lot happened. Uh, before we get to that, George, how you doing? I'm doing wonderful, Kevin. It's starting to warm up here. I don't have to wear sweaters and parkas. <laughs> it is warming up. Went down to Naples and Fort Myers this weekend and had a great time on the beach and uh, made myself less white so that uh, our global audience will, will understand where I'm really coming from. Uh, uh, I, I thought you were looking for a job from Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola well, that's should be. What I read on Facebook. Kevin. I could be a delivery driver for Coca-Cola soon. Um, now the tans. I'm not going to show you the tan lines because that's really weird. But you know, uh, I'm I, I'm using the. Is it melanin or melatonin in the skin? Melanin. One of the melanin. Two. Melanin. Uh, melatonin and, helps you sleep. Melanin is the skin pigment. So I'm using that to my advantage in a historic way in this day and age. Um, it's also tax season. I'm starting to prep for my taxes. Uh, you talked about helping your daughters with your taxes. As a business owner, I have just papers and papers of taxes that you have to go through and make sure all your customers sent you the right 1099s and then all your health care things and your HSAs and... Um, for the next until April 15th my anxiety level and my wellness in my brain is going to be a little off and I ask your forgiveness as an audience to just have a, a little bit of sympathy for me before we get too much further please like this program share this program comment in the comment section on this program and if you have not subscribed yet subscribe to this program George been a busy weekend we took Friday off. Hey, nothing's going to happen. La, 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 la. Talked about the story last week where the, uh, the title was Sparks, Fires, and Fallacies. And we talked about uh, Peter Volk and his uh, website. He put out the Dear Gay Anglican Letter. In that, he addressed his concerns and issues with the College of Bishops statement uh, on the sexual identity and same-sex attraction uh document that they put out followed in the footsteps by uh, Bishop Todd Hunter's statement this has led to some confusion around the uh, global Anglican world especially within GAFCON in Nigeria as to well what does the ACNA believe we know what the ACNA believes because they put out a wonderful document telling us what they believe there's some individuals a bishop and a layperson who don't entirely agree with that statement and have put out their thoughts and this has caused the spark to become the fire we're now dealing with kind of a brush fire going on and when there's a i go for a bike ride every day here in florida i i put on my little my 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 uh shorts and my jersey and i pump up the tires on my bicycle and I put some water bottles on and i go out uh, there's a trail here called the Van Fleet Trail. Right before I get to the Van Fleet Trail, George, there's there's a circle of buzzards. They're just going around, looking for dead cyclists, which they think I'm going to be next. And I'm like, that's what we have here. We have some buzzard bishops trying to uh, look for the ACNA to die or GAFCON to die. And this is going to be something that pleases Lambeth, pleases some uh, people in the Church of Nigeria, and doesn't please GAFCON, and doesn't please the ACNA. This is the fire, because there's incorrect information going around, and there's a bunch of buzzards looking for, for a dead body, where there is none. Let me give some background to uh, our viewers as to all the different pieces, and sort of try to flesh out the references in Foley Beach's letter to his diocese and all these other things. We had the Peter uh, Peter Volk, uh, Dear Gay Anglican's letter signed by uh, three professors at Trinity Seminary, a uh, retired bishop and some 
clergy, great and small, from across the ACNA. That went up, and of course that uh, sparked the, re the reaction that we talked about last week. Uh, I talked to Peter Valk, uh, he emailed, uh, we were in email touch with him as well, and we put up the letter on Anglican Inc. because it was a newsworthy item. Valk contacted us and said, could you remove the name of this person? And I said, uh, yes, but let, tell me why. Well, the province of Alexandria, which is the Diocese of Egypt and uh, the North Africa, is really bent out of shape because one of the signatories is identified as a retired bishop of the Diocese of Egypt. And the problem is that the Diocese of Egypt is locked in a legal battle with the Presbyterian Church in Egypt. The government in Egypt basically treats Christians as monoliths. Second, so, yeah, second class citizens. Second class, second class citizens plus, yeah. they'll talk to the Orthodox, uh, the Coptic Orthodox, mm -hmm. the Catholic, and the Protestants. And the Presbyterians control the sort of Protestant Federation. And they have been, the Presbyterian Church in Egypt has been trying to lay claim to the property of the Anglican Church, the All Saints Cathedral, Cairo, and all these and other things. And the Anglican Church in Egypt has been fighting in the courts to establish a fourth branch, Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, Anglican so that they too have a place at the table and are not being subordinated by the government to the Presbyterians. And if you have a case before a Muslim judge uh, who will hear this case and the Presbyterians lawyer will say, well, look, these Anglicans really aren't good Christians because look, we have a retired Bishop of Egypt who is pro-gay. Therefore, just for the, you know, in other words, you can use that just as we've heard in the past that uh, statements by Jack Spong would get people killed in Africa. Well, it would have legal consequences in Egypt. So that was the first uh, a uh, foreign response, and that was a very limited to one person. It wasn't so much the whole letter, but it was because one person was identified as a retired bishop of the Diocese of Egypt. Then, so that's one of the foreign provinces that Foley Beach mentioned. Then we have the Nigerians hopping up on board. And the Nigerians re released a letter on February 26 under the pen of Henry Ndukaba, where they lay into the ACNA. And the, the letter makes a number of claims that are not true, but they, in other words, that, and they make a number of suppositions that toleration is acceptance, that you're got the Anglican Church in North America is going down the same road as the Episcopal Church by allowing bishops the uh, uh, the subsidiarity of making local decisions on issues. That's how. Uh, the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church of Canada wound up in the place that they are. Um, and it finally comes down to we need the Anglican Church in North America, which we created uh, to either uh, put up or shut up. But they also went down uh, a rather strong, non-pastoral, non-loving approach to gays and lesbians. Sure. And in fact, they went so far as to repudiate Lambeth 110 and the Primates 2016 Agreement, which says that the church welcomes and loves people uh, who have same-sex attraction. Um, we still stand for our traditional uh, teachings, but no, there are no outcasts or outsiders. And the Nigerian statement really divided sheeps and, sheep and goats. Which is... Now, we think we know where this is coming from. Yeah, we, <laughs> without naming names, there are some buzzard bishops at hand. But here's, looking at this from the global perspective, Justin Welby will say nothing to a liberal province that is uh, ignoring Lambeth 110. The Episcopal Church, 
Church of Canada, Scotland, Church of England. You know, you, you go through all these provinces that are ignoring Lambeth 110 on the liberal side, doesn't care. The one conservative province or two conservative provinces that uh, raise up their hand and uh, claim that, that, you know, Lambeth 110 isn't exactly what they believe either, they're going down. He's going to use that as an example of why we have to be more tolerant of the Episcopal Church and more tolerant of the uh, of Canada and other places, because um, Justin Welby is going to indicate that Nigerians they just don't understand. They don't have that language, that that well developed language. Justin Welby is going to say they don't understand because they have just not been taught well. And you know this is this is their society and understanding. We need to educate them on how the Westerners think about sexuality and same-sex attraction and gayness, as it were. He, he's not drawing the, he's not going to hold left of Lambeth 110 accountable, but he will certainly hold right of 110 accountable. And I'm, I'm waiting for that to occur quickly. Now there's wider ripples. Before we go into sort of uh, who, who the buzzards are, on, so the Nigerian letter came out Thursday night, Friday morning. Mm -hmm. It was published on Friday. Um, and on Sunday, the new Archbishop of Ghana, Cyril Ben Smith, Cyril, then the name Ben hyphen Smith, Ben Smith, was installed as Archbishop of the internal province of Ghana. Church of West Africa has two provinces, Ghana with 11 dioceses and the rest of West Africa, excluding Nigeria, of course with about six or seven. The president of Ghana spoke at the installation of the new archbishop. And he went into, under his administration, Ghana will never have same-sex marriage. He refuses to even put this before the parliament. Now, let's stop saying, why? That's weird. Why? <laughs> what, you know, well, what's happened in Washington? We have a new administration. Under the Obama administration, the U.S. State Department was very heavy-handed, USAID, for instance, the aid agency, that West Far American aid was tied to governments liberalizing their laws on homosexuality. The Biden administration has gotten off running, uh, has gotten off to a fast start on this, saying that, you know, unless, you know, there are strings attached to our helping you financially. Now, the European Union has always been this way. It was just under the Trump administration, we sort of pulled back. But now it's getting pressed. And so the president of Ghana is being pressured by his Western uh, partners, US and Europe, to go to change his laws. But why does he choose to make this statement at the installation of the Archbishop of Ghana? because he is making sure that the church, the Anglican Church of Ghana, nails its colors to his mast and to this issue. Mm -hmm. So the Anglicans in Ghana, for instance, are basically being saying, okay, we want you to sign up, but we're being told, you know, are you guys going soft on this issue? Yeah. And so the Nigerian letter had a political effects in West Africa, as well as effects in the United States. And now, Kevin, let's talk about the buzzards. Who benefits? Who, where, where did, there was no, as far as we've been able to tease out from all this, there was no phone call from Abuja to Atlanta before this letter was written yeah. saying, can you tell us what's going on here? My off the conversation, my off the record conversations, my contacts uh, all said, nobody from Nigeria called and said, what's going on? Uh, they just made all these assumptions, uh, many of them incorrect, some of them correct, and uh, it's like the, the game of telephone when we were kids. You sit in the classroom and uh, one person would have the instructions, this is a sentence you say to the person next to you. By the time you get to the end of the line in telephone, it's a completely different sentence. And that's kind of what happened here. I, somebody, in my humble opinion, uh, was a, a little pissy and said, I'm going to call back to the home office. And we're going to get this, we're going to get this straightened out. 
we're going to nip this in the bud, <laughs> as they used to say <laughs> in Mayberry. And, and so we have somebody here probably called uh, the home office and delivered through a telephone conversation what's happened. And that would explain the messed up letter that came from Nigeria. You may remember, folks, a year ago there was a flap where the uh, Cana, um, which had the part of Cana which had not joined ACNA, which had withdrawn, appointed a number of new bishops. And uh, one of these bishops was really out there into prosperity gospel teaching. He was teaching false doctrine. There's no question about that. And ACNA basically embarrassed the Church of Nigeria. And through back channels and through and through feeding Kevin and George stories, we brought this to the public. Well, and the Nigerians from, the, the news came from Gafcon as well. But yeah. yeah. And the Nigerians were forced to basically say this guy promises never to do it again, keeps mm -hmm. his mouth shut. It was the Nigerian Cana was tarred with being heterodox. Now Cana is on social media saying, see, we truly are the only Orthodox Anglicans in the, in the United States. This is why we needed to stay tied to Nigeria because you can't trust the ACNA and the Americans because they'll go soft at the first moment. So part, I don't know if payback has any uh, point into this, but certainly institutional preservation and institutional advancement is being done so that the Archbishop of Nigeria's advisors, the advice he's getting and the conversations he's getting, basically are not, they're helping short-term advances for individual groups, but they're basically making Nigeria a target for Justin Welby. It's allowing the Kenyans now to go ahead and approve the ordination of the consecration of the woman bishop in uh, the woman assistant uh, because the, the, the fire is off out from under them and if you know America can do this Nigeria is saying Americans could do that well we can do this uh, so the short-term political gamesmanship we see is I don't want to say could fracture the, the AFCON I don't think it'll do that but you notice that the, the elders the Ben Kwashis are not involved in this and if and why are they not involved in this because i think they were cut out by people that pursuing their own agenda yeah and, and another issue we have is every time you get a new primate we go through a new learning curve under P peter akinola they had excellent communications with the west for the press excellent under his successor uh it was dreadful absolutely dreadful and now we have a new guy, and they have the Anglican, uh, or I f they have a cable news channel for Anglican News in Nigeria, which is doing a great job. Mm -hmm. So, but it is a little on the flamboyant side in its reporting. So, we're seeing uh, no continuity, and with COVID preventing these guys from getting together, getting together face to face and talking, and. This is the opportunity for the buzzards to come out and try to pick the carcasses of the people they hope are going to be dead. So. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, the hope is that uh, the looking at what happened last year, uh, some of the bishops here from Nigeria must only hope that the ACNA would not succeed so that they could prosper. Um, that that why would you not join the ACNA? They're not pure enough. Let me draw the distinction between um, prosperity gospel and are we, we use the word heterodoxy. What do we want? To, what do we want to call the desire to add gay marriage into Christianity? Is there a single word we want to use on that? I would call it heterodoxy yeah, heter rather I, than heresy, because yeah. heresy speaks more to the person and work of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. Christ. I'm right, sure right, theologians right. will. Yeah. None of these people are denying that Jesus is God. They're okay. just coming up with a different understanding of ethics and morals and what okay. the bible means okay they're using the same they're playing with the same blocks as we are uh but they're just prosperity gospel is just as evil as her heterodoxy 
There, Kevin said it. Ouch. Ooh, really? Yes, it really, really is. And in seminaries in Nigeria, through back channels, I hear it's still being uh, teached and certainly appreciated by seminarians. That there is a way to become wealthy through uh, being a priest and a bishop. Ouch. That is just as bad as heterodoxy. I'm sorry. Ouch. I didn't mean to say it, but I said it. So when I see buzzards flying around the sky going, oh boy, I can't wait to pick apart the ACNA. Um, the ACNA has its problems. GAFCON has its problems. But boy, there is a Bible verse that talks about the person who has a sliver that they're trying to get out of somebody else's eye when there's a big chunk of lumber in their own. And in Nigeria, you have a chunk of lumber. Sorry. Now, is to the oft predicted collapse of the ACNA and GAFCON. I would, you know, some people are likening this to a fatal wound, like a gunshot to the chest. To me, Kevin, I think you'll understand this, and I think the fathers out there will understand this. Have you ever stepped on a Lego piece in the middle of the night in a barefoot? This is pretty close to it that. hurts. <laughs> it is painful. Kind of makes you, you want to get die. rid of the kids. I know. <laughs> you don't die. This, it, Gaff, Acna has stepped on a Lego block in the middle of the night. Yeah. It has not been shot. It's not been murdered. It's not going to collapse. No. Mm -hmm. And as Gafcon has got one foot raised, hopping around the living room with the lights off, they're knocking over tables and chairs. But they're not going to die. Yeah. Uh, the pain will stop in about a half hour or so. Yeah, yeah the, and the buzzards will soon go away to see this. There's no carcass to chew on. Um, there, there, there's better things to do with your time than try to uh, uh, pick on those who need help and encouragement. And uh, right now, the ACNA needs some encouragement. You guys are doing a great job with the statement from the College of Bishops. Bravo. Need some work on some internal, you know, communication and some accountability issues you're 10 years old you, you, you'll get it it takes a little while longer need some you need some help on who has control of the logo <laughs> you're gonna get it don't worry i i see that solution just in in the short horizon they're gonna they're gonna nip that one in the bud um but in the same respect does the acna suffer from uh techitis no we, we've had some people come over from the Episcopal Church early on, but I don't think they suffer from the long-term um, heresies that we find uh, in the leadership of the Episcopal Church. And I think the ACNA um, does not mind somebody holding them accountable, whether it's Nigeria in a correct fashion or it's another province. There's nothing wrong with accountability. We desire it. We desire correction if we're Christians. When we're wrong, we want somebody to say, hey, stop. You, stop. You're, that's wrong. Let me show you through scripture what is right in this. And um, I see GAFCON growing stronger out of this. And I see the ACNA growing stronger out of it. It's just, it's, it's a Lego in the night. Now we have to teach the kids to pick up their Legos before bedtime. Real simple. It is a spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. I mean, but if there's a one theme that ties all the stories we have together is that the spiritual warfare is real, it's alive. This is an example of, I think, spiritual warfare. People, of course, are the agents for mm -hmm. actions. But the underlying spirit is not the sp Holy Spirit. It's the spirit of dissension. And if we look over at the Church of England, it too is suffering from spiritual warfare, a malaise. Um, there was an there was a, an op-ed in the Telegraph uh, on I think it was Sunday, and I'll read it. Church bureaucracy is out of control, by a woman named Emma Thompson, not the actress. Emma Thompson is a rural parish volunteer and a good actress, <laughs> and a good actress, but it's not the same Emma okay. Thompson. She makes the point, and this has really taken off on social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter. This has really been retweeted and reprinted, and it's behind a face wall. Uh, sorry, what's it? Paywall. Paywall. Paywall yeah. uh, 
but people have photographed the article and put it up so you can if you look you'll find it and what she's saying is that the church of england is increasing the ranks it's hiring more bureaucrats more middle managers while cutting the uh, clergy in the parishes and the net result is that uh the church of england is run by the same sort of people who run secular society and you know and as we all know from listening to politicians and working in industry people with inflated egos and inflated job descriptions uh who really don't actually do the work that gets things done um and this disconnect of uh between the people at the pews and the bishops especially of just utter disdain that i hear in people's voices about the bishops of the church of england individual clergy are cherished and loved and of course some despised because they're pretty bad at their job but that they're not the problem it's really the leadership and really the emphasis on the management culture of the past church generation once upon a time, the Church of England's bishops' ranks were top-heavy with theologians. Uh, today, they're top-heavy with people who in another life would be uh, Sears regional managers. Um, and that's that's correct. But not top-heavy, middle-heavy. Middle-heavy. These are middle-heavy people who, you know, just... <laughs> You, you want to put them in a parish, but, oh, they're, they're not really parish priests. You don't and, want to make and, them a bishop, because they're, they're really not, not bishop material. And they're not blessed with high-flying leaders. Um, I'm sure all these people are nice, pleasant people. But in the way the English system of appointing bishops works, you have a committee run by one bureaucrat, and essentially the same bishop is appointed again and again and again there's no real diversity mm -hmm. so we have stephen cottrell or cottrell pretending we're, we're americans we, we will screw it up anyway <laughs> we'll say cottrell you can say cottrell he he was famous in leaving uh the diocese of uh chelmsford which is the east uh, east of london that he's going to cut 60 uh, parish positions. Meanwhile, his diocese is uh, taking on more diversity officers and women's officers and uh, interfaith ecumenical officers. And he, uh, when he became Archbishop of York, he was kicked upstairs and he started giving these uh, started talking like he was going to be dismantling the parish system uh, of, you know, basically replacing the, the priest in his parish with the team uh, in the central office running out uh, to take care of stuff. And he just, well, he's not very bright. Or he, not, well, that's not I fair. You don't say that. He, it, he's it, not... It, he doesn't come across as being someone of, he's no Rowan Williams, uh, he's no George Carey. Uh, he's no Kevin Coulson or George Cogger. Okay. <laughs> but but, it, but my, my point is, that you look at this guy and you think, you know, this could be a politician, this could be a union leader, this could be just about anything but an archbishop. Because well, the holiness factor is really, really not, not well, strong there. We, we always get to this point in time when a church leadership looks around and says, why aren't we growing? Why are we stifling? Why are the church is empty? And the last thing they ever think of is, well, what are we preaching? It's always something else. You know, well, the music's not good enough. The, the stained glass windows aren't cleaned you know, well enough. Um, we don't have enough programs, this and that. They, they never look at what they're preaching. And uh, this is an exact example in the leadership in the Church of England. They look for a million other excuses other than the gospel. And they've watered it down so much over the last um, six or seven decades that they'll never figure out why their churches are empty. They'll never figure out that when the church 
uh, is a copy of society, there's no reason to go to church. Yeah, so. I mean, today the the Church of England it's it's risk averse, it's image conscious, mm -hmm. it's uh, it seeks to protect its reputation of public persona. It doesn't seek to win souls for Christ, and it doesn't seek to be unpopular in the world while being faithful to God. Um, so that when Justin Welby recently was on uh, in the press saying we shouldn't be mean to each other, we shouldn't be so savage, we should be nice to each other. And the response that people had was that, well, he's basically telling us to stop criticizing the bishops because the bishops are savage to people who don't toe the line but once people start complaining about incompetence, we get these "oh, be nice" statements. Well, wasn't there a, a, a female bishop in Scotland, I think, who was being brought up on bullying charges? Anne Dyer. Ah, that's that's right. a Aberdeen and Orkney was one of the few conservative dioceses in the Scottish Episcopal Church. In mm -hmm. fact, its bishop uh, was uh, Gafcon friendly and you know Lambeth One Ten friendly. And it's a small diocese in terms of number of people. It's way up in the north of Scotland. Uh, and they had an Episcopal election and they didn't, they, it deadlocked. And so when that happens in Scotland, the College of Bishops in Scotland can appoint somebody. And so they appoint, and the current primus of the Scottish Episcopal Church is really, really PC. He, he, he's, he's really the PC primus. Uh, and he wanted to have a woman. And so they picked an English woman to be the bishop of the most conservative diocese. They didn't really consult the diocese. They didn't talk to the clergy. And the woman was not ideal. She was a buddy. She was part of the inner circle of the liberal chattering classes. But she really didn't have any pastoral. When you have a small rural diocese, you really need to be pastoral bishop you can't just stick it in your office i think you also need a driver's license yeah there's for some i think for medical reasons she can't drive and doesn't drive and i don't think the job provides a driver uh, so she's not really out in the she's not out there well she's in in office and she starts firing and she starts yelling and bullying and has finally reached the point that the times of london reported that uh complaints have been given to the bishops uh, but the bishops said well we can't do anything because that's not how our canons work but the noise in the Times of London finally got the Scottish College of Bishops to start an inquiry on bullying by Bishop Dyer uh, and that she's she was a, according to her critics she's a heretic she's one of these people who doesn't know what to do so she responds by being rigid and nasty that's spiritual warfare yeah in other words here we have somebody clearly not called by the holy spirit to be bishop but who ticks off particular boxes look at our diversity among the college of bishops look uh look at us rather than focusing on the power of the risen christ of the, the risen christ and, and before somebody out there's doing this right now stop we're not criticizing the sex of the bishop this applies to male and female bishops the world around who are in office having never uh, really discerned the call of the Holy Spirit in this call they they're, they're pursuing and they were they just promoted up the chain and I we, you and I have spoken to so many bishops in the Church of England we're just like how how is this person wearing purple same in the Episcopal Church. <laughs> I, I, I remember I was at an executive council meeting one day talking to, and this was probably eight years ago, a, a, a bishop from the western regions of America. And I'm just sitting there, how? How, you know, how did you get there? Why are you wearing purple? So. Well, and there are games being played in Australia also on these issues it's the same battle same spiritual warfare um but it's it's the uh, fact pattern is different 
in Australia, the uh, General Synod has been postponed indefinitely. As of, as of last I looked, they haven't set a new date. Why that matters is that this was going to be the showdown over same-sex blessings. We have some Australian dioceses that have gone ahead and their bishops have authorized same-sex blessings and they're doing gay marriages. They are conducting them in their provinces, right? Yes. It, yeah. And this was going to be the battle where they were going to be basically smacked down. Both sides are happy for a postponement indefinitely. The liberals want to post. The liberals want to create facts on the ground. They want to have enough enough gay ma marriages, enough clergy compromised by gay marriages that they can't back out. Enough dioceses on board. The conservatives are in transition. Uh, Glenn Davies, the Archbishop of Sydney, is in an extended period of office due to the COVID virus, and he's going to be stepping down sooner rather than later. And if we head into this battle over the soul of the Anglican Church of Australia, I think the Conservatives want to have somebody that they know is going to be there for the long haul. Um, well, people was, tell me... It's my impression, well, it's my impression the Conservatives have the edge in this in Australia. Yeah, but okay. if they blow it, if they blow it now, it's done. Okay. So that... Uh, if they manage the succession in Sydney, Geoffrey Smith, the current Anglican primate of Australia, is a quiet man. He's the Archbishop of Adelaide. And our sources in Australia tell us that quietly he's been cleaning up his provinces. Mm -hmm. And so he's on the right side, but he's never going to be the warrior that, say, Glenn Davies or uh, Peter Jensen were. So the eyes are, you know, the, the talk now is who's going to be the arch, next Archbishop of Sydney and where is he going to take that church in this coming fight? Because at the end of the day, it matters what Sydney does. And also the Archbishop uh, in Melbourne is going to be retiring shortly. So we're in transitions. We have the, the Archbishop of Perth, who's all set to jump on the gay bandwagon uh, as soon as she can. So the so the uh, so the Anglican so the conservatives in Australia really do need to consolidate and have all their ducks in a row because if they shoot, you know, when an elephant charges you and you got one bullet, go with that. You, you got to get it the first time. Uh, church politics. All right, George. I think we covered. I got all four stories down here. Um, good episode. Going to be a little. There's going to be a little feedback, a little pushback. Um, we invite you guys to go to the comment section and comment there. And if you see this posted somewhere on Facebook and you want to join the conversation, please do. Do it respectfully. Uh, do it prayerfully. And we will hopefully see you Friday. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 649 of Anglican Unscripted.